This happened when I was only five years old, so most of the information I gathered was through my parents. I lived in the middle-class neighborhood in Chicago in a two-bedroom apartment with my parents. The apartment building was gated and you needed a passcode in order to enter through the front. The back side of the building, however, was open and led to the alleyway where residents could throw out their trash, which was common in Chicago. My upstairs neighbor was a woman around 40 years old who lived alone with her cats. I know, cliche, but she was a sweet lady. One time she went on vacation and asked my parents if they could feed her cats and she left them a key. While she was away, my dad tried to enter her home to feed her cats, however, the keyhole wouldn't budge. My dad felt bad, but he couldn't get in to feed them until the lady came back from her vacation. My father was so apologetic for not being able to feed them, but the lady nonetheless understood and even offered to show my dad how to turn the keyhole as she went on vacation often and needed someone to tend to her cats, so my parents kept the key on the key hook. My mother worked a 9 to 5 and my dad worked night shifts in order to not have to leave me with a babysitter. My mother and I often stayed up and watched friends together. I swear this is where my love for the show developed. Anyway, one night as usual my dad was off at work working his usual night shift and my mother and I were up at night watching our show. While the show played and my mother recounted hearing footsteps upstairs but not the usual set of footsteps followed by the patter of the kitty's paw steps. No, this was multiple footsteps and muffled talking. My mother didn't hear any screaming and just heard some music playing. As this was a Saturday night, my mother just thought that the lady upstairs had company over and didn't think much of it. Sunday came and went and on Monday my mom decided to call off for some reason or another. We were all laying on my parents' king-size bed when we hear a knock on the door around 11 a.m. My dad opened the door to two police officers and a woman who was the upstairs lady's friend. The police, along with the friend, explained to my parents that the lady had failed to show up to work, which was not like her, and she was not answering her phone or her door. The police officer asked if my parents had seen or heard from her, but my parents said no. My dad remembered that he had a key and offered it to the police officer. My dad joined the two police officers and the lady's friend. When the officer went to put the key in the keyhole, it wouldn't turn so my dad jumped in and showed them how to open it. According to my dad, the two police officers gave each other a strange look but continued to enter the apartment as the friend and my father followed. They were greeted by the cats but there didn't seem to be anything out of place and till they reached the room at the end. When they walked in, they found the lady with a pillow over her face, blood-stained clothing from what looked like stab wounds. The friend cried out hysterically but was held back by an officer and my father so as not to taint the scene. The other police officer began to call in the wellness check turned murder scene. As more police, forensics, and detectives showed up at the scene, my parents were questioned separately. My dad was asked to go down to the station for further questioning. He tells me now it was because he became a suspect since he had a key and knew how to open the door. This was important because there was no sign of forced entry. When they were able to corroborate his alibi, they let him go. A week had passed and my parents were able to gather information from the police. They said that the woman's debit card was used at an ATM where they were able to obtain a picture of a man and they released the image to the public to see if they would get a hit on it. Apparently a kindergartner told her teacher her dad was on TV, and this somehow led to her father being detained and charged along with three of his friends with the murder of this lady. What still rocks me to the core is what follows. When they questioned the men, they confessed and told the police everything. They told a story about how for weeks they watched a young Latina woman with her little curly-haired daughter, studying them. They knew when the father went off to work and how long the two, daughter and mother, were alone in the apartment. They studied the building for weeks and knew that the backside was open and led directly to the back doors of each apartment. They concocted a plan to break in to do God knows what to my mother and I. The night had finally come when they knew my father had left. They were waiting at our back door when they heard someone coming down the steps with a trash bag. 
It was the lady. She locked eyes with them and knew something was off immediately and turned to run back to her apartment. She, unfortunately, was not quick enough. They grabbed her and pushed her through her back door while muffling her screams. She stood no chance and I shiver at the thought of what that poor woman suffered through and how that could have easily have been my mother and I. I'd had my eye on this place for a month or two and was hoping for better weather to come around. However, circumstances forced my hand and I had to go in sooner than I planned. The homeowners posted up a for sale sign and with the market being the way it was at the time, I assumed I didn't have much time before it sold. The house caught my attention in the first place just after Christmas. I happened to be driving by after casing another place and noticed all the boxes stacked up next to their trash cans. Among the best things they'd received was a pair of LED computer monitors and one of those 40 inch LED smart TVs. Mind you, at this time, stuff like this was still fairly expensive. There were also a laptop and PlayStation 3 box in the pile. All this cool new stuff made me jealous. I know I may joke, but leaving out all these boxes is an open invitation to thieves. The best thing to do is break them down and put them inside your garbage cans. The term out of sight, out of mind applies great in this kind of situation. There was a couple of other places on my list before this one, but the day the sign went up, I knew I needed to act fast. So just after lunch, I climbed through a window in the garage and snuck into the house. Most of the afternoon, at least until 3pm, was mine to browse. Their comings and goings were very familiar to me by then and I was confident I had plenty of time to work. Inside of the house, everything was top quality and the air smelled clean and fresh. I can't say I expected anything less. The home itself was modest, but just from their cars, it was clear they were well healed. I did a cursory glance through the living area before I moved on to the bedrooms. There wasn't much to grab and I continued on to the first floor. As I opened it, I was smacked in the face by a wall of stench. It could only be feces, but it wasn't obvious until I looked down and saw the dog kennels. They must lock their dogs up while they're gone, and the dogs must have crapped in the kennels. I couldn't help but feel bad for the poor beasts. There were better ways to keep your dogs from damaging your home. Then, the size of the kennels struck me. They were massive. I mean Great Dane-sized boxes. I thought about letting them out. I leaned down to talk to one of them. Yes, I talked to dogs, so what? And what I saw shocked me to my core. I leaned over to see how bad these poor creatures' conditions really were. But instead of a dog, the face that looked back at me was a child's. It appeared to be a girl, and she didn't look to be more than five years old. I became furious instantly. I quickly looked over to the other can of wounds met face to face by another girl that looked identical. Why in the effing world were there a pair of twin little girls locked up in boxes, forced to wallow in their own feces? These were normal looking beautiful children. No valid reason came to me. I realized I was becoming so wound up, tears had started pouring down my face. I couldn't think of anything other than getting them out of that house. The idea of stealing having long left my thoughts. Right before I opened the first kennel I stopped myself. Hold it right there I thought. I was going to have to do this right or my future in addition to theirs would be screwed. It only took a moment before I figured it out. I leaned over and made a promise to them I was going to get them out of their prison and soon. The terrified sets of blue eyes that looked back at me almost made me change my mind but I held to my purpose and rapidly slipped out of the house. In spite of the rage I felt coursing through me, I continued onto my car and dialed 911. This was almost opposite to everything I'd ever believed, but it was no longer just about me. When the operator came on, I told her I wanted to stay anonymous, but my son had recently been in the home and saw the cages with the two children. He was very upset as well as myself and I demanded the cops check it out. She sounded a little skeptical, but 
she'd pass it on, nonetheless. I wasn't totally sure the cops were going to believe me, so I also called the Crime Stoppers number and told them the same story. I was so furious by now I didn't need to act upset to get my point across. This operator seemed much more interested in what I had to say, but even then, I still had no guarantee that anything would be done. I wasn't going to be able to think of anything else, so I sat a few blocks away and waited, and waited, and waited, and waited. The hours drug by so slowly, I must have smoked two packs of cigarettes in that time. The mother came home a few hours in, and I prayed like never before that the girls wouldn't say anything about my visit. Not too much later, a pair of cop cars pulled up in front of the house. My first thought was that they had said something. However, the longer I thought on it, I realized that there was no way she was going to call the cops over a burglary. She'd be screwed the second she told the story. I knew then that the cops were there to look around. A few more cars and a pair of ambulances showed up soon after and that was when I was sure that they were safe. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried like a little girl. When the cops brought that rotten woman out in cuffs, I could finally relax and go home. According to the news, both parents were convicted of a whole slew of crimes and sentenced for up to 15 to 30 year stretches. Not long enough as far as I'm concerned, but I was pleased to know those poor girls were far from those awful people. When it comes to the twins, not much is out there. Because of their age, there's no names or information of where they landed. All I can say is that they went into the system. Now being a product of the system, I can't guarantee their future will be great. Regardless of that, I'm positive it will be better than it was before. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough not to feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around the house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even seven yet, I decided to call it a night. I woke up sometime later, sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone's screen and number pad blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark and this particular phone was so bright I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9-something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs. Two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in and a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank God he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. 
When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room, which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone was hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put in a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I left my cell phone when I ran through the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached a thousand, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over. I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I'd expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped. All the books and pictures and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line, along with some foil and an empty pen tube which the police said people used to smoke meth, so they think he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted just to not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple of hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though. I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved, except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting to the attic or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. I have submitted this story under a pen name to protect my identity. During the late 90s, I was at a very low point in my life. I was a drug addict, wandering the streets of downtown Los Angeles, eating out of trash cans, sleeping under bridges, and asking random bypassers for spare change. Looking back, I have nothing but regret for that time in my life. But this story is about the incident that made me sober up and turn my life around. One night I was sleeping under a secluded highway overpass. It was fairly isolated because of its location on the outskirts of the city and saw little to no police presence. My sleeping spot overlooked a concrete foundation that stretched on for about 50 yards. It was a pretty long walk to get back to the city but it was a price that I was willing to pay to have this place all to myself. I've had more than my fair share of close calls sleeping on Skid Row. 
so after a long day of panhandling, I slipped into my sleeping bag and began to doze off. I was suddenly woken up by the sounds of screaming. I turned to my side to see a car parked under the overpass, but the vehicle's windows were down. I could tell that there was commotion taking place inside the cab. Now I know what you might be thinking. At first, I thought the same thing too. Maybe someone was getting lucky. But these were not screams of pleasure. They were screams of agony. A chain link fence bordered the concrete platform beneath the overpass. And at night, a white light next to the fence would turn on and partially illuminated the area. It wasn't the best lighting, but you could still see the area from my sleeping spot. I watched in horror as the passenger side door of the car flung open and a skimpily dressed woman exited the vehicle. She was holding her leg, trying her best to limp away from the car. I was frozen in place, almost not believing what I was witnessing. The girl was begging for her life as she awkwardly staggered away from the vehicle. The driver's side door then opened, and a figure emerged from the car. I couldn't quite make out the details of this person because the passenger side of the car was facing me. The person then pointed a gun at the girl and shot her. I remember closing my eyes as the gun went off and opening them to see the woman sprawled out on the ground. She was on her back, and the way her head was positioned was as if she was looking at me. Her jaw was going up and down like she was trying to say something. The memory of seeing her like that still haunts me. The shooter made his way over to her, and when he stepped into the light, I could see that he was wearing a dark hooded jacket with a bandana hiding his face. He stood over her and just watched her for several seconds before finishing her off with a second shot. I was absolutely petrified at what I had just witnessed. I was now sitting up on my sleeping bag with one hand over my mouth, trying my best not to make a sound. But what happened next was a whole new level of fucked up. The headlights of another vehicle at the opposite end of the overpass flicked on and drove up to the gruesome scene. At first I was relieved and stupidly thought that these people were here to help. Not even factoring in that a bystander wouldn't just casually drive up to a scene of a crime with the killer still there with a loaded gun. I guess after I witnessed something so horrible, the logical part of my brain wasn't working too well. But things became clear to me once I noticed that the other vehicle was a black van. And things became even more clear once I saw three men wearing ski masks exiting the van, one of them holding a video camera. These sick fucks were filming this entire thing? There was an exchange of words, and the other two men that exited the van walked over to the dead woman and grabbed her arms and legs then proceeded to carry her body back to the car. The shooter had made his way over to the car before they got there, and the cameraman stayed off to the side and filmed the entire thing. The shooter popped open the trunk, and the men heaved the corpse into it. Without going into too much detail, I'll add that the men did not seem to be concerned at all about... the blood. The cameraman then joined them at the car for a nice, close-up shot. The shooter then walked over to the van and returned with two cans of gas. The men doused the car in gasoline, and the shooter struck a match and threw it, and the car was instantly engulfed in flames. The four men, and myself, watched as the car burned. As I stared into the fire, I became numb. I had apparently reached my scare limit, and now I was just angry angry at these animals for what they had done. Even if this woman was an addict or a hooker, no one deserves to die like that, murdered under an overpass in cold blood. The fact that they were filming this whole thing pissed me off even more. I considered this to be the exact moment I stopped being a drug addict. The four men eventually piled back into the van and left. A short while later, 
I emerged from the overpass and made my way over to the nearest payphone to call the police. I don't think the police took me seriously at first until I led them to the burning car. I was questioned for hours by detectives, and yes, they did suspect me, a homeless junkie of foul play. But I stuck to my story. They did keep me in a holding cell for a few days, which they probably couldn't legally do, but I honestly didn't mind at all. Free showers and food. I was actually a bit bummed out when they eventually released me. I later found out that there were similar killings in San Francisco and Sacramento, and that the perpetrators were wanted by the FBI. I don't know for sure if they ever caught them. I can only hope that they did. After that night, I decided I had enough of living on the streets. The fear I experienced inspired me to get my shit together, finish college, and become an English teacher. I'm proud to say that I've been sober for almost 23 years. Sometimes, seeing the ugliest side of humanity is the cure. I think maybe the scariest thing to ever happen to me occurred in a Burger King of all places. I was on a particularly long drive one time, and it was later in the evening when I started to get kind of hungry. I kept driving for a few miles until I began to see signs of a Burger King. Hallelujah. Fatty, meaty goodness. I find the Burger King, pull off the highway, and park up my car just outside. So as I'm walking over to the actual restaurant, I was pretty happy to see that there was no line. Not only that, but there didn't seem to be anyone inside the restaurant at all. It was as quiet as the grave in there, but frankly, that suited me fine. I was famished by that point, so naturally I was in no mood to be stood in some long line. I remember seeing the clerk stood behind her register, just stood there, almost in a robotic way, not moving. But again, I didn't overthink it. I figured since they weren't busy, she could afford to just kind of take it easy. I step inside, walk up to the counter, and then freeze. Now since this is not my first retelling of this, many people have asked me how I didn't notice the warning signs. Seemingly empty restaurant, server, frozen to the spot, stuff like that. Like I said, it was late in the evening. I had had a long day and I was starving. My situational awareness was not at its best and everyone looking at this with hindsight can go screw themselves because I doubt they're the Sherlock Holmes they think they are. Anyway, I get up to the counter, look at the server, and see she's been crying. Not only that, but she's shaking too. She seems absolutely terrified. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I see something under one of the tables nearby. It only takes a slight turn of my head to recognize what it is. It was a person, lying face down, their fingers linked around the back of their head, and they seemed similarly terrified too, too scared to even look up from this prone position. Only then did I realize that something was horribly, horribly wrong. I just didn't know what. But thankfully, or not thankfully, I didn't have to wait long to find out. From the back of the store, a guy in a mask steps out from behind a fryer or something, a grubby looking gun in his hand, and it's pointed at me. Phone, wallet, and keys on the counter. Now. I can't remember his exact words, but they were essentially that. He ordered me to empty my pockets, and when I did, he ordered me, down on the floor, just like the other dude, I instinctively linked my fingers behind my head. I had apparently interrupted him in the process of emptying the cash registers, or rather, commanding the poor, terrified server to do so for him, which she did. I didn't see much of what happened next, but I know he told her to put the money in a food bag so he could walk out without too much suspicion being raised but that's what the logic seemed to be to me. Before he left, he told us all to count to 100 before we got up, and if anyone did, he'd shoot us through the giant glass windows that pretty much made up most walls. As you can guess, I didn't get up, not until I heard him screech out of the parking lot in a car. My car. Needless to say, 
that was quite the messy situation to follow up with for many months after. Halloween night is always accompanied with a feeling of fear, even if it's a small amount, perhaps it's just psychological, but there always seems to be an eeriness to the night, at least in my experience. During the events of this story, I lived in a small, quiet town in the upper northeast region of the United States. My hometown is filled with lots of forests, and being somewhat of an outcast, I would usually just hike on the trails around my house. I would get out of school and just walk for hours before I came home. The older I became, the more deep into the woods I would go. When I was 16 years old, I found this little cave tucked deep within the woods. It was probably about 200 yards or so from the main road. The cave sat at the base of a small cliff about 30 feet high. It had a pretty big opening and the deeper you went into the cave, the more narrow it became. The cave seemed almost man-made, like it was carved into the side of the cliff. About 20 feet or so into the cave was the back wall with all of these strange rock formations of all different sizes. Also off to the right there was a small little tunnel that I tried to explore one time but gave up due to the fact that it was barely big enough to fit through and not to mention it was accompanied by pitch blackness. So for the next two years I would often visit this little cave. When I would have difficult days in school or just needed to get away from home I would go. I would read there, meditate, or just listen to music. I would always think of crazy origin stories for the cave like it was some kind of special place with an interesting backstory. In reality, it was probably nothing of the sort, but it was fun to imagine the possibilities. My senior year of high school, I decided I was too old to go trick-or-treating and I didn't have a friend who even asked me to do anything. At about 9pm, I gathered all my belongings for the night and started my hike to the spot. I wanted to wait until about 9 o'clock-ish so all the kids were off the streets and it would be really quiet. So I thought it would be a really great idea to get some candles and go to my little cave and read some scary stories. I figured since Halloween was on Friday, I could stay out all night and read. My parents trusted me and really never worried about me because I was responsible and had never gotten in any kind of trouble before. From my house, it would probably take me about 45 minutes or so to get to the cave. I know for some people that may sound crazy to walk that far, but for me, it was therapeutic to be outside in the crisp fall air, especially on Halloween night. Shortly after 10, I started to close in on my destination. As I approached the large opening of the cave, I thought I could make out a low orange flicker coming from the walls of the cave. I turned my lights off and slowly approached. I immediately felt disappointment as I crept slowly to the opening. Someone else is using the cave, I thought, but what I saw was not somebody reading or just hanging out. There were four women in the cave, probably late twenties or thirties, all holding hands. They were standing in a circle and seemed to be speaking in unison, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. There must have been hundreds of candles lit because it was illuminating the entire cave, even several feet outside the cave. I couldn't make out what the women really looked like but they sort of looked ragged or dirty, their clothes being loose and baggy. I sat and just stared at these women for several minutes trying to figure out what they were doing, which turned out to be a huge mistake. As I sat from the bushes and observed, the women suddenly stopped chanting and abruptly turned and stared at the small hole in the wall. I swear at this point I heard a growl coming from the cave, not like a growl from a dog, but something different, something distinctive. I saw a movement from the small tunnel inside the cave, and before I knew it, the four women all snapped their heads back and looked right at me, looking at me through the bush. But how could they see me? It was pitch dark out, for God's sakes. All four women in perfect sync slowly brought their fingers up and pointed at me, and in a flash, they all began to run at me. I turned and ran as fast as I could. As I made my way towards the main road, all I could hear was screaming and laughing, or was it crying? I don't know, it was hard to tell. As I was closing in on the main road, I turned one time to see if the women were still behind me, and not only were they behind me, one of them was inches from me. Her teeth were yellow, her eyes were big and black, and she had the most haunting smile I've ever seen. I turned and ran as fast as I could, never looking back again. 
I got home that night and just cried because I had no idea what else to do. I'm now 26 years old and still have not gone into another forest by myself. I'm not sure what I saw that Halloween. People playing a prank. I honestly can't tell you, but I know that I never went back to find out. This story took place in the summer of 2017. My friend and I were young teenage girls at the time. We didn't live in the best of areas. One night we decided to go for a walk around the local pond, which wasn't far from my house. It was pitch black out that night, although there was some sporadic lighting from the streetlights, which were all spaced far apart. However, there was still enough light to guide us to the pond. We left my house and began walking up the dark street. We stopped at one end of the pond and sat down on a bench. This bench happened to be right under the single light that overlooked the pond. And since the light was directly above us, anyone approaching would see us perfectly illuminated. Looking back, it wasn't a good idea to sit there at night. It practically made us a target. We talked for a while, but after a few minutes, I noticed some movement in the distance. I squinted my eyes and saw a group of silhouettes approaching us. Since I'm a paranoid person on a good day, I alerted my friend to the presence of what I assumed was a group of people swiftly coming our way. We debated for a moment on what we should do. The first option was to keep sitting on the bench and assume that they were just harmless individuals who wouldn't do anything to us. The other option was to take no chances and make a run for it back to my house. Something about these approaching figures was threatening to me. So we quickly got back on our feet and started off with a speed walk. I looked back and my worst fears were confirmed. The group of figures was now sprinting right for us. That's when my fear truly kicked in. My friend and I began to run full speed I kept looking back at the group as we ran and noticed that they were gaining on us. I could not make out any features of the people due to the lack of lighting, so we were just blindly running from several faceless figures, which added to the terror. We eventually arrived at my house and hid in my front yard for a while. Since we were being followed, I didn't want them knowing where I lived. Eventually we went inside making sure to lock the doors behind us. When we were talking about it after the fact, she said that she looked back like I did, so we don't actually know if they attempted to follow us the whole way back. For all we know, it could have been a group of kids just playing a prank on us, but under the circumstances and the area's reputation, we were glad that we didn't take any chances. So a little backstory, I grew up in a close-knit community surrounded by houses and parks. As far as crime goes, very little ever occurred there. Things came full circle last year when I moved into a house in my old neighborhood. It was just off the main road that connects to the local mental hospital. There had always been an underlying concern from the residents about that place, but there had never been an incident where a patient escaped. Over time, we got used to it. However, things changed over the years. It was no longer the quiet, peaceful place I remembered. The amount of noise and crime I witnessed after moving in was astonishing. My wife travels a lot for work, and when she does, I tend to sleep in my game room towards the back of the house. One night, I had a horrific nightmare. I was laying on a bed in a dark room at the hospital. I got that feeling that you get when you know you're being watched. I scanned the room to find my wife standing in the corner, looking me directly in the eyes. Josh, wake up. Someone's about to break in. You need to wake up. I sprung up and immediately grabbed the handgun I kept in the nightstand. I opened my back door to find someone standing in my backyard with a crowbar. The figure took a few steps towards me with the crowbar raised above their head. I raised my firearm. You come any closer, and I'll shoot. The figures stopped dead in their tracks. 
then took off, jumping over the brick fence that separates our backyard from the main road. I called the non-emergency number and let the dispatchers know what had just happened. It turns out that the man in my backyard was an escapee from the mental hospital. It was the first time anyone had ever escaped from that place, and he ended up in my backyard with a crowbar. Lucky me. This story is from the perspective of a female. I have worked as the night shift telephone operator at a casino hotel for 14 years. I'm used to dealing with drunks, assholes, and perverts on a daily basis. I get a lot of unwanted attention because of my voice. I've been serenaded and even proposed to. I'm usually able to shrug it off. But on the night in question, I received a phone call from someone who was an extremely deranged individual. It started off like any other normal Saturday night. A drunken guest called from his hotel room. Hey, uh, can I get two sets of towels up here, please? My pleasure, sir. Is there anything else I can get for you? Uh, yeah. You. I sighed in annoyance. We'll get those items up to you shortly, sir. Have a wonderful evening. I hung up, thinking that I had heard the last from that guest. But I was wrong. About 15 minutes later, he called back. Hey, everything's here. Except you. Um, I don't work in housekeeping, sir. Damn. Your voice, though. I bet you're hot, aren't you? Why don't you come up and see me? Sir, I'm not allowed to leave my desk. Do you need anything else? Do you not understand what I'm telling you? I need you. I hung up on him again and continued to take calls. That night, I was the only operator on duty, which was usually the case. After a while, I had almost forgotten about the guy when he called again about 30 minutes later. Hey, I've got champagne and cheesecake up here for you. Not for me, sir. You enjoy it, and have a good night. Wait. Don't hang up. You're the love of my life. I've never loved anyone but you. I was losing my patience with this drunken idiot. Sir, I don't have time for this. Enjoy your cheesecake and have a good night. I said firmly before hanging up. I knew that I lost my temper, but I couldn't help it. This was getting ridiculous. A few minutes later, he calls back. If you won't come to me, I guess I'll just have to come to you. I want you. I need you. <laughs> Sir, you need to stop calling me, or I'm going to inform security. I'm trying to work here. I slammed the phone down again, slightly rattled. This has never happened to me on this level before, and it was starting to scare me. He calls back. What do I have to do to get you up here? You know that I know your boss. All I have to do is tell him that I want you, and you'll be mine. I practically own this fucking place. One phone call, and you're gonna be up here, on your knees! I hung up the phone in disgust. Then I quickly dialed security and explained to them what was going on. All the security guys are buddies of mine. They said that they would be up there to talk to him immediately and to let them know if he called back again. A short time later, he did. They're trying to keep you from me. They don't know how much I love you, how I need you. I'm coming for you. I called security again. They told him that if he called back one more time, they would have the sheriff's office come out. So a short time later, I received another phone call from the lobby phone. At first, all I could hear was heavy breathing. And then, that familiar voice. I'll fucking find you. I need you. You belong to me. Where the fuck are you? I hung up and called security, who immediately sent an officer to the lobby. 
They also said that they were going to call the sheriff right away. Since I don't work at the front desk, I'm nowhere near the lobby. I'm in a safe, undisclosed location, behind a secured door, where he couldn't possibly find me. But still, the caller's behavior frightened me. My coworker then called me from the front desk. Hey, there's this creepy guy up here asking about you. I didn't tell him anything. Do you need me to call security? Oh my god, are you kidding me? I've already called them. They should be on their way. Where is he now? He's standing right- Oh shit. Where'd he go? Fuck. I'm calling security. Lock the office door, okay? After that, I quickly contacted my buddy in surveillance. They said that they were aware of the guy and were tracking him. He was pacing by the employee's door, looking for another way to get downstairs to where I was. Don't worry, security just caught up with him, and the sheriff just pulled up. I felt sick to my stomach. I didn't realize until just then how bad I was shaking. This man was a lunatic, wandering the halls of the hotel, looking for me. He doesn't even know me for Christ's sakes, and has no idea what I look like, and yet he was determined to find me. I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. I have no idea how much time passed before the head of security, who was a good friend of mine, came into the office. The sound of the door opening made me jump. Hey, it's going to be okay. Just breathe. He's banned from here, and the sheriff deputies have escorted him off the property. You should go home. You want me to call the manager? No, I'll be okay. Really, thank you. I just wasn't prepared for that level of crazy tonight is all. Are you sure you're going to be okay? <laughs> I was far from okay. But I knew there wasn't anyone to cover my shift, and I was no longer in danger. For the rest of that night, several of my buddies and security came by to check on me. I don't know what that man said to them. And I don't think I want to know. But I'll tell you this. I've never seen a group of big tough guys look so worried and disturbed before. I guess that's what happens when you come face to face with someone who has truly lost their mind. Hi, I'm Irene, 25, and an office worker. I'd like to share this story with you to raise awareness and to always be cautious with your surroundings. One day, I sat on the pavement waiting for Lily. She's my friend. She was taking a lot of time to come pick me up. Then, I noticed a car parked on the other side of the road. I got the suspicious vibes when I glanced at it. The second I looked, it left. That was odd, I said to myself. I tried to calm my nerves after all that bone-cracking work I've done all week long. Lately, I've been very busy in the office, and I was taking all of my strength. I was losing energy. Not to mention feeling angry and tired all the time. I wanted to quit my job and to start a new one. I was very deep in my thoughts when Lily stopped in front of me. She smiled and said, Hey, sorry you got into some traffic on the way. It's alright, I replied. I stood up, went to the passenger seat door and opened it, but with much more force than I had intended to. Dumping my bag on the side and threw myself onto the seat. Hey, is everything alright? Lily seemed worried. I looked at her and tried to smile. Yeah, just too tired after all that work. I nodded and said, Yeah, it's a lot of work at my office too. Wanna grab a drink? I looked at the car apart far from us. Sure. Lily drove towards her favorite cafe. She looked for a parking spot that was not very hard at this time of the day. We walked towards the cafe and ordered our usual. The waitress, Naomi, like always, sat beside us for a drink, since there were no other customers. So how was life? 
Luckily, Naomi never asked about work. All I talked about was life, the city, and odd customers. We talked about everyday stuff. Trying to forget about work and other troubles of life, I laughed the loudest at jokes and spoke more than the other two. After we were done with our drinks, we said our goodbyes and walked to the car. As I sat in the car, I immediately saw the same old modeled SUV parked. Something wrong? Lily asked. I, I looked at her, and she was looking at me with eyes filled with concern. Nothing. Let's go. I need some sleep. Maybe that's all. We both went home, and in no time, I found myself lying on my bed and trying to sleep. I found it hard to sleep. Just an hour ago, I've been dying to lie on my bed, but now that I was, it was hard for me to sleep. So I went to the kitchen to make something for myself, since I felt really hungry at the time. While I was looking around in the fridge, I glanced at the window and froze. The same silver old modeled SUV was parked right in front of my house. I was sure that was the very same car. Was it following me? Why would anyone follow me? Maybe I was just overthinking and it was just a coincidence. Yet this has happened three times in a row, which was very alarming. I hurriedly ate my food and went back to the window and saw that the car had gone. I didn't know what it was, but it can't always be a coincidence. I know that someone's stalking me, but I tried to shrug it off since I still have work for tomorrow. I walked back to my bed and went to sleep. The next day, I walked on the pavement waiting for Lily to arrive when a car stopped in front of me. Hello ma'am, do you need a ride? I thought it was very creepy, so I denied it. I didn't even get the chance to see the guy's face. Not long after, Lily arrived and the guy drove off. I ran to her car but froze only to realize that it was the same SUV. I didn't notice it at first, and this time, it wasn't just a coincidence. I really was being stalked by someone, but who? Hello, or do Irene, or do Irene? All of a sudden, I came to my senses and realized that Lily had been shouting at me. Yeah, sorry, I kind of dozed off. Lily looked at me with concern and said, What is it this time? I looked at her, trying to hide my fear. What? Lily rolled her eyes and said, You know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been acting strange recently. I looked outside and said, It's honestly nothing. I just couldn't sleep last night. I don't think you want to be late, so let's hurry up and go. Lily started the car and drove towards the office. The whole day, I felt scared and was deep in my thoughts about that silver SUV. How long had it been stalking me? I didn't know. But it felt like it had been doing that for quite a long time. Now, wherever I look, I could see the silver SUV. I knew I was just overthinking, and it could still be a coincidence. I had not even seen the car well enough this morning. Maybe it had been some other car with the same color. Maybe it had not even been silver at all. I knew I was just being overly concerned about something that didn't even exist. I started to work again and typed on whatever I had to do. I did my work and tried not to go back to thinking about it. But somehow, paranoia just started to grow inside me. What if he was someone very dangerous? What if he broke into my house and waited for me there? What if he wanted to steal from my house while I was at work? Or what if he wanted to kill me? Many thoughts came to my mind and I tried to ignore them all. But again, I would start thinking about the same thing. Fortunately, I somehow managed to complete my tasks by the end of the day. That same day, I left the work earlier and called Lily to tell her about that. I went to the same pavement where I always waited for Lily. The evening was a cloudy dull one that increased my anxiety. I was trying not to think about anything and scrolled down on my Instagram when a blue sedan stopped right in front of me. Hey, Irene, right? I'm Lily's cousin, Billy. She's busy, so she told me to pick you up since I was passing by the area. Come on, get in. 
I was so confused why she didn't mention anything about her being busy. If she was busy, she would have told me. Irene, are we going? I've got to be somewhere too, you know. I nodded and walked towards the other side of the car when it struck me. Irene's cousin, Billy, had left for a vacation just a week ago. Lily had told me about that. Billy had never picked her up, but I've seen his picture once. And now that I thought about it, this guy did not resemble him at all. I stopped at the back of the car and was thinking what to do when he called me. Irene, everything alright back there? My heart was beating very fast as I was confused about what to do. Should I run and later call the police, I thought. I turned on the camera of my phone and started recording. I recorded the license plate of the car and then walked to the driver's side, making sure he came in the video. I think I'll take a taxi. You can go ahead. He looked in the mirror of the car and then at me. But Lily told me to pick you up no matter what. Please get in or she's going to be mad. I paused for a moment because I didn't know exactly what to say to get rid of him. I then blurted out, Lily would have called me if she was busy. I walked back onto the pavement to be as far from him as possible. And anyways, her cousin isn't here in the city. He was about to say something when Lily arrived. I ran towards her car and got into it. The sedan drove off right away. Who was that? Who was that guy and why did you seem so scared? I tried to calm myself while she gave me some water. I don't know who that was, but I think he's been following me for quite a long time. We, we need to call the police. We need to call the police. Lily took her phone out and called the police, who arrived within 10 minutes. I explained everything to them and gave them the video that had the guy's face and the car's license plate on it. The police left after some investigation. After that, we drove to the cafe where Naomi worked. Thank God you were smart enough to not get inside that car, said Naomi, looking at me from head to toe. You are fine, right? I smiled at her and said, Yep, I'm fine. Dodged a close call too. I actually feel better than normal now. I was lucky enough to use my brain or else I would have gone with him. Lily had not spoken much and had been worried the whole time. She had been insisting on taking me to her place for safety until the guy was caught. I've accepted the offer as I knew that Lily would keep badging me to death till I would say yes. Well, I hope he doesn't find out Lily's place, said Naomi. I nodded at her and said, yeah, but if he knew her cousin Billy, what else do you think would stop him from finding out her house? I think he knows our address too. We drank our coffee and stayed a little bit longer than usual to calm Lily's nerves. She was easy to scare after all. We were about to leave when Lily received a call. It was the police and they had caught him. The next day, they found out that the guy was a serial killer and killed women for fun. He would do some deep research about them and find their everyday spots and stalk them everywhere. When he finally had the chance to get them, he would take them to his house that was outside of the city. He had been following me for about a month now and had been changing cars very often. He would sell one car and buy another one so that he wouldn't get caught. It turned out that he also had an old model silver SUV that he had just sold yesterday in order to buy the sedan. I felt lucky that I had been smart enough to think and not just go with him, otherwise they would not be able to find me, ever. I would just remain a mystery. Even years after that, I would get goosebumps thinking about that incident and the fact that I had only been a moment away from death if I had entered the car. Our official merch store is finally here. If you want to support more of our channel, check out our merch shop. The link is in the description down below. See you on the next video.